Devin Newman, Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Engineering Systems from MIT. She'll be giving a lecture titled, Human Mission to Mars, Designing the Biosuit for Extreme Performance. Sorry. Professor Newman received a PhD in Aerospace Biomedical Engineering from MIT. Her experience is in multidisciplinary research that combines aerospace, biomedical engineering, human in the loop modeling, biomechanics, human interface technology, life sciences, system analysis, design, and policy. Professor Newman's research studies are carried, throughout, carried out throughout spaceflight experiments, ground-based simulations, and mathematical modeling. Her research efforts include advanced spacesuit designs, dynamics and control of astronaut motion, mission analysis and engineering systems design, and policy analysis. She also has ongoing efforts in assistive technologies to augment human locomotion here on Earth. Professor New Newman received her bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and her master's degree in 1989 from MIT's Technology and Policy Program and Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. With that, let us now welcome Professor Newman, please. Thank you very much. It's, uh, you can hear me all? Wonderful. Well, it's a real honor to be here. I'm very delighted to be here this afternoon with you. I look forward to uh, talking to you, but also very much to uh, fielding your questions and, and answers and showing you some of our, our latest designs. So I would uh, like to take you from, on a journey from Earth to Mars, if you'll allow me. We'll get started. What I'd like to share with you this afternoon, uh, my passion, my passion is uh, combining the disciplines of aerospace and biomedical engineering. We call that the area of bioastronautics. Essentially, it's keeping astronauts alive in space and very extreme places like the moon or Mars. But as you'll see, right now I'm concentrating a lot of research efforts uh, here on Earth as, as well. I'm very interested in Earth applications as well as the space applications. For my teaching and research at, at MIT, I follow a philosophy of love, act, discover, and innovate for all of my teaching and, and research projects with, with my wonderful students. So we'll explore human perform performance really across the, the spectrum, as I said, looking at locomotion here on Earth, how we might enhance it, what I can learn for the, the studies of, of astronauts, uh, both in the weightless environment of space, say on the International Space Station, as well as in partial gravity environment on the, the Moon or Mars. And. Um, then I want to open it up to you, too, to discuss what's the, the future. What are the future challenging engineering design questions that you might all be interested in and, and have and produce? So I'd like to start with this slide to challenge you a little bit in your own careers, engineers or scientists. I'm not sure who we have in the audience. I think it's a large engineering uh, student audience. So how can you come up with really breakthrough revolutionary engineering ideas. I can't say that I have the answer, but I'm very fascinated by the question and looking and admiring some great thinkers and some great ideas out there, I put together this, this list. That sometimes the creative ideas, the creative genius is often just in the general, the generalities, you know, maybe not all the specific details. And we're really looking to expand knowledge with breakthrough technologies, inspiring a great leap forward, not just an incremental change, but a, but a great leap forward. Maybe transforming intuition. You know, we don't want to get stuck thinking all the same way. We want to transform it and maybe we can solve more important questions. I'm sure though, the environment is very critical. The students and the faculty working together in an environment that really fosters that creativity, uh, imagination, and, and innovation. So I have a, a few folks there that I take inspiration from. Um, Picasso, of course, an artist, but it was known for very much breakthrough, almost every decade of his career, different breakthroughs. And Galileo, of course, an incredible uh, scientist who uh, envisioned and thought of science and discovery in a very new way. So I take a lot of lessons learned from folks like that. Just a background slide on what happens in, to astronauts in spaceflight, in case you don't 
think of astronauts living in space every day like I do. When we get to microgravity, of course, we float freely around. That's the weightless environment. When we get to the moon, we have one-sixth gravity. So you're very light. On Mars, you have three-eighths gravity. Since NASA funds and a lot of my research, uh, you can't get away from acronyms, at NASA, but I'll try to only use two in my, my talk today. Extravehicular activity, or EVA, when you're in a spacesuit outside the craft, or IVA, when the astronauts are inside the vehicle. So I'm very interested in looking at how the performance, and specifically then to how the, the mind, and uh, the neuro, the sensory motor controls are changed in these very extreme environments. As an engineer, I use a lot of engineering techniques, control theory, dynamic analysis, uh, but typically I apply them to human rather than, say, a spacecraft or an airplane. Crossover to understanding just a little bit of physiology because those are some of the biggest challenges we have for astronaut performance. If you go on a long duration space mission you'll, for months, three months, six months, you typically lose your muscle. Your muscles will atrophy to 30%. You lose about 40% muscle strength. But that's the good news. The skeletal system is much more of a challenge. You might lose 1% to 2% bone mineral density, the structure of your skeleton, in each month of space flight. So my Mars mission is a four-year mission. Now, who wants to sign up for it? I still usually get hands, especially the students. Come on. There we go. I have a break. There we go. I have some. So to go to Mars, it's, it's going to be about two years round trip. We're going to go you're going to conventional propulsion technology. Six months on the way out, you'll probably be in floating in the craft in microgravity, except for if we use artificial gravity, which I'll come to. A year and a half to get home, though, because the orbital mechanics dictate that. And you're going to spend about 600 days on the surface of Mars. So that's how we get just under a four-year trip. So we're really interested in how we can keep our astronauts healthy and well and performing very well. I have some images here in the bottom of the slide. These are typical um, micro scans of the bone. So on the far left, you see a very healthy, intact micro scan of a 37-year-old male. Next to it, you see a very unhealthy micro scan of an 84-year-old male with osteoporosis. Then you'll see some of the data that I'll show you, share you with our animal experiments from mice, and uh, then a little cartoon to your far right. My job essentially is to make sure that our Martian astronauts don't look like that squatty little man. Um, so we don't always get to fly space flight experiments. We do a lot of studies here, of course, in the laboratory at the NASA centers, and flying on aircraft and going underwater. So what you see here is a simulation of the, of, that was a lunar simulation, 16G. Now you'll see the subject in a Martian simulation, underwater loping. This is underwater locomotion. So we're simulating at how would people perform on the moon and Mars. Now this is actually in parabolic flight. I think at this time was NASA's KC-135. So that's a lunar simulation. And here's a Martian locomotion simulation flying in this aircraft. So this truly is 3 8 gravity then. The pilots are flying a very true 3 8 gravity parabola. We don't get very long duration though, so we have to fly many parabolas. Matter of fact, we fly about 40 parabolas. Um, some of the data you see, these are ground reaction forces. On the left, this is normalized data for the right foot, the left foot, the right foot. And then on the right, you just see the sample from the Martian data. Now I told you it was 3 8 gravity compared to 1 gravity but you see that the peak reaction is reduced just by about 50%. So we think about things like that. Well, then how is that going to affect the muscles and the bones? How is this person going to perform? And you'll see the frequency, the interval, is lengthened here. It's more of a loping motion, more of a loping motion than it is at 1G. So these are some of the, the biomechanics. And, but we use every simulation here on Earth as we can. Like I said, flying in airplanes, going underwater, um, hooking up people from the rafters. I call that my moonwalker. And uh, because, of course, we can't get rid of gravity, so we have to perform many different simulations to look into our astronaut performance. So 
these, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about musculoskeletal lesions, but not for my astronauts. This is for a little 20 gram mice. I have to say I like astronaut subjects better than the little mice. Here's a, a mouse on a Mars condition for you. He's running across a force plate. So I'm seeing what the ground reaction force is of this little mouse. And there are many different trials. Now, why would we want to <laughs> look at mice on this? It's suspended. So this is a suspension system. Actually, I call it the moonwalker. And many trials are going over here. Well, what can we learn about this? Well, we can actually take a very close look at the muscle deconditioning and the skeletal deconditioning. Now, if you look at the image on the left, that's a whole bunch of data from over 30 cosmonauts and NASA astronauts and the percentages of bone that we lose in the skeleton. So you'll notice up in the skull, we're not, uh, the astronauts are not losing uh, much bone loss at all. Matter of fact, they're kind of thick skulled. If anything, they're gaining a little bit of bone. You can ask me why. Um, if you're interested in that. And toward the arms, again, we don't see much skeletal loss. But as soon as we get down to the vertebrae and the spine, and especially the legs, the longitudinal support structure of the bone, now we see very significant, always over 1% per month. Typical missions these days are at least six months on International Space Station. So that's quite significant bone loss. And the data you see on the right here is for uh, muscle loss in in this mouse model, and that's 23% loss from the Martian data. It's colored in red here compared to our control data. Of course, the musculoskeletal system, from engineering sense, you know, are, are actuators and levers working together. So we try to study both because it doesn't do us any good if we just study one or the other because it's such an integrated physiological um, system, if you will, motor control system for, for our performance and our locomotion. Okay. so. As I said, the muscle loss is uh, one of our easiest challenges, even though it's very significant. The skeletal deconditioning, we are very interested in it, first for astronauts, of course, but what's the relationship to aging? Because here on Earth, when you're 50 years old to 60 years old, you might lose 1% bone mineral density over an entire decade. From 60 years old to 70 years old, again, maybe another 1% to 2%. For majority of the young folks in the audience, you're great. Your bones are doing well. You're not losing any skeletal loss. Matter of fact, you're turning over your entire skeleton. We all are every 11 years. You might not have thought of that, right? You get a new skeleton about every decade. Because bone is an organ, we're always building bone and we're taking bone away. But when we go into space flight, uh, maybe the signals are, are causing, a, causing the system to do something else. We're not in homeostasis. A couple things could happen. So what you see on the left is a, the, basically the femur, my leg bone, from my hip to my knee. We take a couple um, computed tomography slices, images, through the bone. And I'll we'll talk about two kinds of bone I need to talk to you about. The cortical shell, the outside of the bone, the hard outside of the bone, and the inside of the bone. We call that the trabeculi, the trabecular bone, or the spongy bone. And we wonder about the material properties. We wonder about the structural strength. So just let a uh, little cartoon up there. It's just this model of a cortical shell. It's just a cylinder. And to the left, this is age uh, jacketed. That's for our mice. It's a control. No, no bone loss. But if you go to the right, a couple things could happen. You're losing a lot of bone. The inside diameter could increase. Or the outside diameter of my conical shell could decrease. Or worst case, you could have both happening at the same time. Uh, we have about 9% cortical shell loss. If you do the bending moment analysis on that, the structural analysis, that equates to about a 30% decrease. Um, that's very concerning. Then you start thinking about things like fracture. So just in red here, I've circled. This is what happens to our astronauts. We actually now have measured, we're looking for the mechanism. The bone loss is coming from the outside diameter essentially being sheared, if you will. We're losing bone from the outside diameter is, is getting smaller. We're not building bone. The system, the osteoclast is what it's called, to kind of create bone seems to still be very active. But the osteoblasts, the bone builders, seem um, to be kind of in, in a bit of um, taking away too much bone more taking away the bone than we're building. So the osteoblasts now are not building uh, bone to replace the out outer shell. 
if you look at the spongy bone or the trabecular bone, the bottom of the side, then here's the uh, micro scans for that. And we see an 11% shearing. I think of it as 11% shearing of the struts inside. And then as an engineer, you used to say, well, I want to do the structural analysis on this. And you ask yourself the question, well, am I losing 10% of my struts? turns out we don't think so, and that's good. We think that actually the struts, if you will, are being sheared. Again, the diameter is changing. We're losing about 10, 11%. But if you do the bending profile again, and you look at your ultimate uh, moment calculations, you would still have a stronger bone. But we really worry about fracture with these type of numbers, with this much bone deconditioning, this much skeletal loss. So how are we going to counter this muscle and skeletal loss that I've just told you about. The astronauts use exercise. Uh, they use pharmaceuticals. We have some designs for assistive suits. And what you see here is a spinning bed, artificial gravity. Now this is a two meter centrifuge. Here you see a four meter centrifuge because it's two people head to head and they're kind of bicycling. So we call artificial gravity actually the ultimate countermeasure because all of the bone loss information that I've showed you on the slides that's all with about two hours of exercise per day. We can't run the proper scientific control and have half the astronauts not exercise and the other half of the astronauts get to exercise. It wouldn't be ethical. So everyone who flies in spaceflight, especially on long duration missions, everyone exercises. And I'm still reporting these, this bone loss. So exercise is not going to get us all the way. We still have much too much significant bone loss. So again, we look at, well, maybe it's going to be a combination. The exercise, there's some kind of promising pharmaceuticals that are also used here on Earth for, to treat osteoporosis. We still don't think that'll get us all the way there. So then we look at, again, centrifugation, artificial gravity, but very short-arm centrifugation. These both pow human power pedals as well as the electric motor centrifuge are in our lab at, at MIT. So we do a lot of experiments there to see if we can uh, attain um, no physiological conditioning. We call those countermeasures because they're countering the physiological effects. Um, maybe we could fly one of these in a, in a spacecraft to Mars. They're not very big. It's only as big as a human, so it's two meters. So the design of these would actually fit into a conventional spacecraft. Okay, then I wanted to show uh, you, uh, we do fly an aircraft as I mentioned. And actually I think I'm gonna turn the sound up for this one because I wanted to kind of highlight our students, and these are undergraduate students, like many of you are. And your new hirees. And they said we would like to see hirees that have the full life cycle experience in developing an aerospace product. We're trying to make our conceived design, implement, and operate the context of an engineering education. So we came up with uh, this course, which is really a three-semester course, and started basically with a clean sheet of paper where we gave them a problem, something to build, gave them some requirements, and they took it from there, built the thing, and are now operating that facility in NASA's Zero-G aircraft. The students were presented with a basic concept and allowed to run with it in their own pursuits. The concept is that instead of building large, expensive satellites, we can make them cheaper by perhaps building smaller ones and coordinating their activities. On the KC-135, the real goal is to see if we can predict how our algorithms will work in an environment other than that in which we design them. So we can't do that in the lab, we can't test the zero G, but we can design controllers, go up on the KC-135, see how they behave in zero G, and see how our predictive capability is. They did pretty much what they were supposed to do. You lift it up, and let go, and it stabilizes itself. So we, we demonstrated that, which was one of the goals of the, of the flight. I think that we got some good data on both what the sphere is doing and on what the plane is doing, because uh, the plane does some pretty extreme stuff, and that what the plane does also affects how our experiment works. I was telling somebody the other day that if we're in a group walking somewhere where I have images of the right stuff, <laughs> floating in the back of my mind, and everybody I tell about the project, their jaws just drop. So that was done uh, initially with um, our three semesters, with starting with juniors, and then their, their fourth year, their senior year. As I said, just as a really great hands-on experience.
experience for the students. When we did an assessment uh, of our engineering case, of education, we thought, well, maybe we were doing a pretty good job at the conception and the design, the paper design, but we weren't giving our students enough of the putting the subsystems together. It's really tough. So we spent a whole semester on the implementation because the controllers have to work with the propulsion system, with the structural system, and so we really needed a semester to do that. And then we spent the final semester really, again, giving operational experience because we really think that the whole life cycle design, and I heard uh, some wonderful uh, briefings earlier today that uh, many of you are involved in design projects for uh, multi-semesters, multi-years, multi, multi -years, and, and um, I can't say enough about it. I think it's actually a really necessary engineering training to, to really get that hands-on and go all the way through to the operation. There's nothing like uh, learning from the, the real experience and then iterating and doing this, this design. So this experiment today is actually a very uh, um, well-funded research experiment. So the students started it with, with a couple of the faculty, and now it's currently flying on the International Space Station, and we're taking data almost daily. By Katie Coleman is the astronaut up on International Space Station today, so every 90 minutes, you know, orbiting the Earth and performing the SPHERES experiment at least once a week. So there's downloaded data, and there's a big educational project uh, dipping down to high schools all the way through college. The high school kids actually get to program the SPHERES, these formation flying satellites, and they can send up their algorithms and see if they can actually fly the things and, and uh, control it. And we've had some good results. <laughs> Not too many uh, uh, of the spheres have gone, gone astray. Okay, so still in the microgravity environment. This is um, one of the experiments I ran actually in a collaboration with the Russians to study long duration astronaut performance. This, this is astronaut Jerry Leninger. We flew basically smart sensors force plate. So you can see these little restraints. The handhold, he just grabbed onto the handhold, torqued himself around. There's a foot restraint. And uh, we're just measuring actually the, the forces and torque. The reason that we started this research was to see if the astronauts were really disturbing the microgravity environment of the spacecraft. It's true that the astronauts can disturb the microgravity because you can push off and you can cause quite a lot of vibration. But I'll show you some data in the next slide. It turns out that the crew are very good at what they're doing, and they're not disturbing the microgravity specification. And then in order to model this and really understand this very unique kind of floating type of motion, we came up with a, a model. The, the model that you have in, see in front of you there is a 37 degree of freedom control and, and dynamics model. We're trying to see, again, how people adapt to the microgravity environment, because it's quite different than what, of course, you would see here on Earth. I'll show you some, some videos of just some, some motions that we had the crew do for, for fun here. I always say, you know, don't try this at home, but um, it's great to be in space because you get to try out all these fun things. And if you're studying dynamics right now in class, uh, I'd encourage you. And uh, we, uh, based on Tom Kane's theory of of dynamics, we were really interested in, okay, can we ask the astronaut to, to move around all the degrees, you know, the three axes of rotation. Um, this is quite, so what's happening here? We're not defying physics, it's just changing the angular momentum of your limb for motion. So we think we can actually train astronauts. This is a rookie astronaut. He's actually very, very good. He's the best rookie astronaut we've ever studied, mostly. He floated up a little bit, but he had very, very good motor control. The other two, this, this is a Dr. Ray Seddon, actually a surgeon astronaut. And this is, she's a veteran, so she's had quite a lot of a space experiment uh, time. So um, it's fun in terms of, again, we don't get to fly experiments all the time, but leading up to this, we uh, worked on the gymnastics ring. So if you study divers or gymnastics and things like that, those are kind of the athletes that seem to have the best, the figure skaters seem to kind of have the best intuition of changing your angular momentum here at Earth in 2D, but it's very fun. You get all six degrees of freedom if you try this in, in space. And then again, we design the sensors, we miniaturize them, the electronics, so we can kind of quantify uh, what the motions are. So after a couple years of taking data, thousands and thousands of astronaut activities touching our force plates, this is a histogram. So what you see on the y-axis is uh, thousands of, of astronaut push-offs and landings and motions. <laughs> and what you see along the x-axis then are the uh, forces. In, in Newtons, I have very small the forces in pounds because sometimes NASA engineers get confused. 
and um, we have some issues with that um, costing missions a lot of money. So I speak both in uh, newtons and pounds for those who uh, need it. I'm, none of you do, I'm sure. Um, so what are, we, what are you looking at? It's a histogram with thousands of activities. The important point here, these are push-offs and handles. If, if I were to have you walk over a force plate here, it's, it's one body weight, right? So for me, then, you know, it's 550 newtons or so. What I'm showing you up here, you should first say, especially if you're a structural engineer, wait a minute, these are very, very low forces. 96% of all the forces collected are 20 newtons, 30 newtons. So this is an order of magnitude less than anything you would see at 1G. Now, what's the reason for that? Well, you've already seen the videos. When you're moving around in the space environment of weightlessness, I don't push off with my feet or uh, it's basically toes and it might be a finger. If I wanted to soar across the auditorium, all I would do is just push off ever so slightly and I would move all the way across the auditorium. So essentially we took all this data to prove that the astronauts were um, very well adapted. They used very, very low forces and they weren't disturbing the microgravity specification of the space station. They were also, so they were using a very high precision control maneuver with a very low velocity. And so um, that's important because we want to make sure that they literally don't rock and roll the space station, that they don't disturb, say, a material science experiment, or they don't disturb um, if you have a telescope that you're you know, trying to do some astronomy and things like that. So we had to prove that the crew were actually uh, not disturbing the microgravity specification of the space station. Okay, well, let's move on to talk about spacesuits a little bit, and now moving outside the vehicle, or EVA. A spacesuit has to provide pressure necessary to stay alive in vacuum. It has to protect you from an extreme environment, all the, the harshness of uh, radiation, micrometeorite hits. It should enable your mobility and human performance. We'll talk about that a lot more in the coming slide. It should provide your thermal comfort. It has to, uh, space is very extreme. If you're in microgravity, it's a plus or minus a couple hundred degrees Celsius. At Mars is a very cold, dead place as far as we know. So we need a lot of thermal control in our spacesuit to, to keep people alive. The backpack, the portable life support system, the white backpack you typically see on spacesuits, that's going to provide you oxy oxygen, it's going to scrub your carbon dioxide and some humidity control and thermal control there, power communications and data. Now we have to give credit to the current engineering design of the current spacesuit. It's, it's quite an engineering marvel. I think about it as the world's smallest spacecraft. Because you can put a little jet pack on it, kind of have a little motorcycle uh, spacesuit, and you can do everything in it. it is, it's providing all of the life support facilities as an entire spacecraft. So it's really quite an engineering marvel. So it's important to give it credit. The current spacesuit that NASA uses is called the Extravehicular Mobility Unit. I have a little blooper of the Apollo, the only time that humans have been to another uh, surface, and this was in the 1.6 G environment. And this is the Apollo suit. For the 1960s, this was phenomenal. But uh, poor Jack Schmidt is the astronaut here, and he can't really reach his scientific instrument. And if you're a scientist on the moon, that's a problem if your suit doesn't allow you enough mobility to bend down and pick up that instrument. Um, so we have a big challenge ahead of us. Again, just a little bit more about conventional spacesuits. They're gas pressurized shells, so you're working in a balloon is a good way to think about it. Um, they're a low atmosphere. They're providing about 30 kilopascals, 27, just under 30 kilopascals, and uh, they're quite heavy, it's, they're massive, 140 kilos. Well, that's okay if it's in a weightless environment, but that's not okay even when we're going to the moon and Mars because that's, that's too heavy, it's gonna squish my astronaut. You don't wanna be working against the suit. Today we're really working against the suit. They're very massive, they're not flexible, and so our research then is in the area of trying to um, look at a much more flexible suit, looking uh, at giving the astronaut normal motion. Uh, and there's some data here, real quick. If you test the current spacesuit, this is again gas pressurized balloon suit, and you're just to flex your elbow. If you just flex your elbow, what happens is you'll flex, and it'll require 10 or more Newton meters of extra um, torque, and then it'll spring back on you. So if you're trying to do uh, you know, a test, you're always working against the suit and you're wasting a lot of energy because you're always working against this gas pressurized shell. So you get pretty fatigued and you're working. So we basically do a lot of human experiments. We track the kinematics or the joint angles. Then we put you in a spacesuit 
in the lab, still at 1G, have you move around. And then what we'll do is use those kinematics or joint angles and we program them into a robot. I have a life-size robot that's basically my surrogate astronaut. Why do we use a robot? Well, because it can follow the kinematics in real time, very precisely, and the optical encoders then give us a high precision measurement of the torque, the elbow torque, the hip torque, the ankle torque, so that we can take measurements, um, again, of performance and kind of quantify the torque and joint angles. So, if we go to, if we go to Mars, um, what kind of suit should we design? No. <laughs> this one has some, some sound. Still from yeah, Apollo, 16G. Still not having a lot of luck trying to, trying to do any real exploration, real scientific return. And then you hear one of my, see one of my graduate students, um, Rex Wu, on the, our moonwalker. So this is in the lab, again, simulating it. We don't always have a space suit available, so we kind of make our own exoskeletons and we tune in the same stiffness. This exoskeleton has the same stiffness at the knees. And there we are in, in the lab on the treadmill. You'll see kind of the loping, the loping type of motion. There's a gas analysis. There's an, we're looking at the energetic expenditures to overcome basically these stiff suits. So that's the energetics. And the data that's plotted on the right here shows you that the subject actually used more energy for the lunar condition, for the 1.6G, than for the Mars condition. It shouldn't make sense uh, at first sight. And then for the one gravity condition, the Earth condition, the energy expenditures are much more, much more than we could even plot on here. But you might expect from 1G, you would use so much energy that would be reduced at Martian gravity, and that might, you would, might expect it might be reduced more. Well, uh, when you start studying humans, <laughs> you'll find no responses are linear and differences. And so this really interesting bend was very interesting for us. Some of the reason I showed you those little lunar blooper videos, what we think is going on that for a very light gravity level, light loading condition, one six your body weight, you're wasting a lot of energy. You don't have very good posture stability control. So you're using additional energy just to balance as well as trying to get your, your work done. Where it's different for the Martian loading case on the Martian loading case, it's a fantastic loading level. Uh, you kind of feel like everyone could run a marathon. You're not using very much energetics, and you just go and go and go. It's very comfortable. So it was a very interesting, uh, surprising result that now we've tested over and over in different simulators and, and, and repeated. Um, so the bottom line is uh, also, you kind of see this loping um, motion here. When you're on Mars and there's an emergency, should run, don't walk. You actually you lose, you use less energy going faster. And that makes no sense at all. We thought the data was wrong when we first saw it. How could that possibly be? If I walk here on Earth at one meter per second, I won't use too much energy. If I go running at three meters per second to jog, I'll probably use about twice, as amount, twice the amount of energy. I go faster, of course, but I use twice the amount. Well, it turns out for Moon and Mars, something very crazy happens at the higher velocity locomotion, you actually use less energy expenditure than for the walking. So it's really a pretty fantastic um, result, and we've been able to, to repeat that one over and over again as, as well. So the biomechanics are really changing things. Okay, so this is um, in kind of inspired um, our engineering designs to come up with a new system that we could think about for, for Mars or a brand new spacesuit kind of for Mars. But first, you have to know your history. So we went back into the archives. You've never seen spacesuits that look like this because these spacesuits have never flown, but they were prototypes, and I think they were actually really interesting kind of creative ideas. So kind of call this one the, kind of call this, because you shouldn't think of a spacesuit doesn't have to be a white pressurized gas shell, right? What if you just start with a clean sheet of paper? What would a space, I don't know, you might come up with a round spacesuit. Pretty creative design. Now, uh, this is from the late 1960s, and so it was at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and they hung Apollo arms and legs off of this spherical shell. Well, I don't know. This is actually very interesting. There's actually some underwater life support suits, if you will, that look like this. Now, this is another revolutionary design. This is Paul Webb's space activity suit. This is from 1971. 
and I really need to give him credit because I think Dr. Webb had a great idea just way before its time, and so it really inspired our biosuit design. So there he is, he's kind of shrink wrapping his subject here, but he is demonstrating the mobility. See, how he gets on a treadmill and this poor fellow has to, has to climb on the treadmill. Uh, but now truth in advertising, why didn't NASA use this suit uh, in the 70s and beyond? It's because you couldn't dress yourself. It's really important for astronauts to be able to dress themselves. We call that donning and doffing in the spacesuit world. You have to put on your own clothes and take them off and you should do it very quickly because the time is uh, very precious in space. And so it takes two other gentlemen to kind of squeeze him into this suit. So you'll see. It's actually six layers of material. Now this is the hard part. <laughs> they literally have to kind of pour him into this suit. So this is a space activity suit. Again, six layers. Now the unbelievably wonderful thing about this though is, again, it's early 1970s. So between 1970 and now, and, you know, late 1990s when I started working on this, there's been huge material science improvements, huge advancements in polymers, huge advancements in materials. So I said, this might be a really great idea, but it just came way before. Let's, let's give it another shot. So here he is. Uh, I actually speeded up, you know, the video going on and on, but it just takes too long to get into the suit and out of its suit. So then after preliminary funding, the NASA didn't fund it anymore. But we started our work about 10 years ago, and again, I think it was a great, great idea. In the background, you'll see part of a poster that I have. It's a kind of an infographic, and you see all the space missions ever flown, all the human missions ever flown, starting way back from Mercury to Gemini, all the NASA and the Russian missions, and um, a couple recent Chinese missions. So to date, we've flown just over 500 spacewalks, extravehicular activity, in all of humankind over the last 40 years that my Martian astronauts, who the couple volunteers I have in the office and in, in the auditorium here, um, you're on the first mission. We're going to send about four to six people. We don't know yet, but at least four of you, maybe, maybe six. And um, your job in 600 days is probably to do at least, uh, all four of you, to combine over 1,000 space a 1,000 EVAs. So this is a game changer. We need different technology. We need a different system to accomplish just our first human to Mars mission. Our current technology just won't get us there. It's just not quite appropriate and adequate. So that's the motivation for, for our research for the, for the biosuit. And so we started thinking about, okay, how could we do it differently now? This is just to kind of wake you up. Actually, we started working on this way before The Incredibles. Um, but it is, again, the idea of kind of shrink wrapping. So I'm really a very big fan of Elastigirl. Um, in this movie, that's Edna, the little genius uh, scientist, and she's telling um, the mother, it's flame retardant, darling. Well, our uh, bio suit, uh, <laughs> this is the it's not flame retardant yet. Uh, we're using uh, polymers and, and polyesters, so we have to work on the flame retardant part. But what we have been working on is actually the materials and the design to have a very tight-fitting suit. Something, again, inspired by um, Paul Webb's work. I want to get make sure uh, we have a lot of great people who work with us. Of course, at MIT, myself, my students are engineers. We work with design firms, both in the US and Italy, as well as uh, material scientists. And I have a great host of advisors in terms of former NASA astronauts, current NASA astronauts. Uh, there's nothing like um, going to the real users. Uh, only a few people have walked on the moon, so it's very important to get their advice in terms of our current design and how we might achieve our current design. So, so I have a very wonderful uh, friend and, and colleague and model here. You might want to walk around a, a little bit. I'm going to keep I'm going to I'm going to um, keep my presentation going. I'm going to describe the bio suit to you, uh, but there's nothing like seeing the real thing. Now this is a mock-up, okay? You're engineer, so you know what a mock-up it looks like and kind of feels like, so we can demonstrate uh, kind of our engineering advances. But it's only pressurizing her to an extra tenth of an atmosphere. We're at one atmosphere here. So she's only pressurized right now to 1.1. And it's pretty comfortable, you can ask. Um, the engineering prototypes, we'll talk and I'll show you some data from the prototypes. The engineering prototypes, we have to pressurize someone for a third of an atmosphere. <coughs> the design goal is 30 kilopascals. But that would be very uncomfortable here at, at 1G. We test out the real prototypes in my vacuum chamber. So just to make sure that we're straight on, you know, what's the mock-up and designs, you can look and see it. We play around with the material specification 
as well as in what we do and the real prototypes that we test in the lab. So it is a mechanical counterpressure suit. We call that MCP. The only two ways to keep someone alive then in a spacesuit are put them in a balloon, kind of a gas pressurized suit. The big disadvantages there are lack of mobility, as, as you've seen. So I'd like to give someone full mobility. You want to move around for us if you can. It's pretty darn mobile. Um, and it's actually uh, my size, so it is a custom fit suit. This comes from a laser scan. So I think she's a little bit smaller than I am. So um, it's a little bit big um, on uh, her. But what it's doing is custom fit. You, get, you all get your own suit. And um, so we can maximize the mobility, the comfort, and the mobility for you. Now, if you want to turn to the back, um, on the back we don't have the life support system. You would hang your oxygen tanks, probably very small rechargeable um, oxygen tank, but it is kind of a hard back plate there. This is a Dainese um, patented, uh, modeled after an armadillo shell, so it provides you with mobility and flexibility, but it also will protect your back, your spinal cord, and it gives us some hard points where we can hang the life support system, the oxygen system off of it. The rest of the suit is, is pretty soft. And um, what we're trying to do here in the design is make sure that she has full mobility. She's not wasting any of her energy. I want her to be an explorer. I want her to be on Mars. Why are we going to Mars? To look for the evidence for life. So, you know, you need to be working all day. Mars is really fantastic. You know, you guys think that uh, Mount Everest is pretty cool? No, nothing compared to Olympus Mons. Now, Olympus Mons, that's a mountain. You know, it dwarfs Everest. In, in the U.S., we talk about the Grand Canyon a lot. It's pretty impressive. It's a nice canyon. But Valles Marineris dwarfs it. Valles Marineris is, you know, three, four times. And stretch across all of the United States. So Mars is in a real extreme environment. We have great mountains. We have great valleys. We need to explore the whole thing. So we really want to give our astronauts a completely different capability. And I don't want them wasting any energy to overcome the suit. I want the suit to work with them. It needs to pressurize them and keep them alive but then I want all of the motion going into very useful work. So in terms of the design trade-off, we want to, I have this called Delta W, Delta Work. I don't want her wasting any energy. How can I do that as an engineer, as a designer? Well, the pressurization, I've gotten her out of the gas pressurized shell. You're wasting about 75%, we calculate, in the current conventional spaces. That's a lot of wasted energy to move that around. So we can reduce that to zero by pressurizing her, but using mechanical counterpressure right on the skin itself. What other parameters do I have? Well, I have to look, I can look at the elasticity and the energy, the strain en energy in particular. So how can I drive that um, change in, in work to zero so I don't have any extra? Well, you can look at the bending work and you can look at the energy or the elastic work. So we play around with that as, you know, as designers and engineers trying to do that. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in the coming slides. And then we don't only look for astronauts on the Mars. We're not going to send too many astronauts to Mars. It breaks my heart, but uh, you know the reality is, and it's a, it's a bit off in the future, probably about 2010. Matter of fact, it has to be someone uh, your age, in the 20-something, because it's still taking us a while to think about sending humans to Mars. But probably 2030, 2018 is a great date, but I don't know if we'll have our act together by then. Uh, I mean, we, I mean the world has to do this, not, to, <laughs> not me in particular. But maybe by 2030 would be a really great date orbital mechanics wise. We should be ready with the technology to go. But in the meantime, I'm putting a lot of energy into the same type of design, but uh, to treat some pathology and to treat some locomotion diseases here on Earth, specifically children with cerebral palsy. Children with cerebral palsy is kind of my uh, current uh, passion, it's funded by our National Science Foundation. So you see a little fellow here in a little elastic suit, if you will they're trying to train his limbs and uh, the muscles and the bones so that he can have better, better locomotion and better muscle performance to overcome some of the very uh, deleterious effects of cerebral palsy. So a little bit more about the biosuit here. Let's talk a little bit more about the design of it um, that we have. Again, we're trying to minimize any extra work you'd have to do. So how do we do that? Again, as, as engineers, it, it should hopefully be in interesting to you. We, have, we, can check, we can select the materials we make it out of, again, we have to pressurize to a third of an atmosphere. We can check the materials. And when you specify the materials then, uh, there's a couple really important things that come up. You know, your modulus of elasticity that you choose. So if you give me the stress of properties and I have the strain, then E, my, my modulus of elasticity here, capital E, then if I want to drive that extra work or I want delta E to be zero, I would choose a very low modulus for my material elasticity if you give me the stress. 
But there's a paradox here. My second equation, my bottom equation is, if I know the strain and I still want to drive delta E to zero, and you give me the, and I put the stress in the equation, this one, then E is going to have to be very, you want a really large modulus of elasticity. Because again, you want to drive that equation to zero. So it's a bit of a paradox in terms of if you know the stress or the strain, um, we have a big uh, material trade-off here to make. And so we play around with different materials. And then here, there are strain calculations on the left that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. But the design, the patterning, the red lines that you see on this mock-up are really critical. So you want to be a good sport, you walk up. So this will give you some activity. I know you're bored. Um, so we walk slowly in case people, so people can see a little bit of the, the red lines, if you will, if you're looking at that. Well, what's happening here? How do we get, we didn't set out to make a suit that looked like Spider-Man at all. I mean, I'm a fan of Spider-Man, but this is all actually engineering analysis. It's all mathematically driven. So what happens is if you drew little circles all over your skin and you move, again, I'm trying to give you maximum mobility. So say you have circles all over your skin, you move, what's going to happen to that circle? circle is going to move elliptical, right? I think I have a little animation here on this slide. Okay, same equation. So again, think of nice little small. So notice the, the red lines. These are actually, you know, your bisecting diameters from a circle to an ellipse. Now I have it exaggerated so you can see it here on my little animation. But those two bisecting diameters, we actually call these the lines of non-extension, right? Because from my circle, to my ellipse, they just pivoted. They just pivoted, but they didn't extend. So if you trace that, basically you do the three-dimensional eigenvector analysis then, and you have to do it in 3D because people aren't two-dimensional, we're very three-dimensional. So you do that calculation, that's the patterning of the red lines of the suit. Now it's really fantastic, it's, it's kind of phenomenal, it's that beautiful, which is a wonderful thing, it's kind of aesthetically beautiful. It's also following the major muscle groups of the body. So you'll see these lines, and you won't see any, on the knee, you won't, we don't have any lines of non-extension on the knee, because all of the skin is extending on the knee, if you bend your knee in full flexion. So there's some places, some regions where we don't have, and then you see the lines coming together. So it's really mathematically derived to get the patterning then. Why do I want to do that? Well, now if I have these lines essentially that are non-extending, this is exactly where, I think about this as kind of my internal Exoskeleton. I call this a soft exoskeleton, actually, because now I can think that I have some structure. I'm going to put my sensors. I'm going to put my sensors along these lines, these red lines. Um, if I need to heat you up or cool you down, some thermal conditioning. There's black lines in between. The black lines just follow the red lines, if you will. So now we can kind of make it a smart, a wearable suit. And again, when you can get full flexion extension, the arms and legs, but those red lines are not going to extend a lot. So it's our design uh, kind of patterning. That's the patented part about the suit, is um, that design trade. And um, that's actually also, I should give credit to Iberal. Iberal never did the mathematical analysis, the geometry, but had this idea, again, from the 50s all the way to the 70s, uh, working for the, the US Navy. It wasn't published until the 70s, but he never really mathematically derived it. So I've worked with a wonderful students, master's thesis, uh, PhD students, many students, to, to kind of come up with our final design for, for the bio suit. Okay, so then moving on, what can we do? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what we do then, um, we really are modeling the astronaut, but the skin in, in very great detail in terms of this stress strain if you want to move and get maximum mobility. So um, you come to the lab, we'll kind of paint your legs, if you will. We put markers all over you. You kind of watch you. And this is some of the calculations that we get. We can do, I call this a skin strain map. And up on the top, you see a couple subjects, these colors. And that's circumferential strain. So that's going around the legs, if you will, circumferentially. The two bottom pictures, the legs on the two bottom pictures, that's longitudinal strain. So if you look at the little black circles with the X, that's the kneecap. So not surprisingly then, uh, the red is about 40% strain. The highest strains that we model and measure are at about 40%, uh, both circumferentially and then about 30, 35% in terms of the longitudinal. We calculate the shear strain as well, right? The three-dimensional strain, but the shear strains are quite, quite small. The circumferential and the longitudinal strains are really the ones that we have to know about 
so that we can really come up with kind of, we call it, you know, the second skin design for this suit. We really do want to follow the skin <coughs> as precisely as we can to give you a maximum mobility, maximum flexibility. Okay, well, in a little bit, um, well, in more detail, essentially we can do this all digitally. This is actually our, um, well, essentially it turns out to be MATLAB code. You guys love MATLAB, right? I know you do. We love MATLAB as well. And um, so from either uh, motion scanners or laser scanners of, of the leg, again, the leg in motion, we can calculate it. And then just more recently, I told you about these lines of non-extension, but our recent work, it's a little hard to see here, but you'll see these are just the vector projections. Again, you have to do this in three dimensions, your three-dimensional eigenvector analysis. So the reds are those lines of non-extension, but I, we mentioned about the knee, the back of the knee, the back of the leg, you know, the kneecap. Well, we can also now look at, okay, um, what's a, a line of minimum compression? It's not totally, but there's minimum compression. There's also minimum tension lines. So now we can actually give you, you know, kind of a full map, if you will, minimum compression, minimum tension, and then these, these uh, places where there's non-extending. You get a really good uh, kind of map to drive our designs for the, for the suit, if you will. So we call that our skin suit calculator. And where does that lead us? Well, it leads us from, you know, a lot of analysis, but again, we're tr we really uh, now have a design for kind of maximizing your mobility and, and, and minimum energy. Again, I don't want you to waste any energy overcoming the, the suit. So uh, we do the math to kind of come up with the patterning. The minimum energy is we do the strain, energy, stress analysis, picking our material properties. And then many people always ask me about, okay, well, what about uh, active materials, advanced materials? Does the suit need to, you know, shrink wrap actively around the person? Well, we don't think so. We actually think that you can get a lot of pressure production from passive elastics. That's what you see. This is a, the MIT colors, in case you didn't recognize that, kind of the silver and, and red. And so we use passive elastics in terms of the gray or the silver part of the suit here. We put on the patterning, the red lines, in this case over the top. We do have, um, join me for a second. We do have, uh, I think, an area. It's uh, kind of over here to the right, uh, the best picture of it, but I'll show you real here. I think that active materials, can I grab one of your arms? <laughs> uh, makes sense here. Kind of like, I kind of think of this as smart zippers, if you will. Now this is just a little demonstration for you here. See if I can um, open this up. Maybe this one will open up. See which one wants to open up. Um, they're tight. She's kind of fully shrink wrapped right now. Um, but if we open this up a bit, I can kind of extend this and make this bigger. It's a lot easier if I extend that. And then what I can do, this is just a mechanical system now, and if I keep turning it really cinches it up. But again, imagine this was uh, electroactive. I could just push here, and then these, these zippers, if you will, smart zippers, would create even more additional pressure. And they're on the legs as, as well here. So that's, I think, the best place um, for implementation of some of the active uh, materials is um, using them in different specific places throughout the suit, but uh, not the entire suit itself. Okay, so, um, well, how well have we done? Um, we tried to get the pressure production, again, to be, to keep someone alive in the um, vacuum of either the moon um, or a microgravity environment moving on to Mars. On the top left, you actually see our real engineering prototypes of the uh, subject with a student with his leg in the vacuum chamber, and we're pressurizing him then to the the green sensors are actually very, very thin, paper-thin pressure sensors that go between the skin and the prototype. And then again, you see uh, this black prototype here where we can crank, we can crank up the pressure, if you will, kind of cinch it up. And you see the data here from the front of the leg, we um, almost attained 30 kilopascals, but you see a couple places on the front of the leg where it drops to 20, 25 kilopascals. That's very interesting. On the back of the leg, on the calf of the back of the leg, we can, we can get 30 kilopascals um, pretty, pretty consistently. Now, if you look at the, the physiology, if you will, the front of your leg, kind of bend your leg and flex your muscles, if you will. You'll feel bones and muscles. It's a really hard area to get constant pressure production because we have a very interesting shape there. So that's what's happening with the pressure drops right here. It's, um, we're not as tight, basically it's not consistent pressure, if you will, um, given the, the geometry of your, of your lower leg, especially given your muscles and your bones. So we still need to work on technology development. That's still, of course, a research and development project, and uh, the BioSuit is. 
So we actually have 10 different technologies that if I had the entire NASA budget, I would you know, invest in. Um, but I don't. But uh, here are some technologies that uh, I hope you know about or you should learn about if you don't know about. They, I think they're not just for spacesuit design. They're very interesting um, technologies. Electro spin lacing. Uh, some of the artist images up there are kind of provocative. Could you really spray on a spacesuit? People thought that was a pretty crazy idea. As a matter of fact, I have to admit it, maybe it was a crazy idea I had. But it could be possible. So then as a researcher, you go and do your literature review. Well, in 1940 was the first time electro spin spin lacing, electro spinning or electro spin lacing, this is called, comes under both names. And um, you're basically um, flowing a polymer, a charged polymer, you're directing a flow of a polymer, but you can create any polymer you want. That's very important for our design because we know what material we want to make it out of. And then you could essentially spray it onto the body. Now, it's difficult uh, to spray it. It's, it's not very stable at this point, but there's some really great labs working, working on this technology currently. And melt blowing is, is not too different. Again, very interesting, kind of more two-dimensional liquefied polymers into, again, kind of a latex, if you will, or, or elastic sheet. It's a melt blowing works very well in the labs right now, but only in two dimensions, on two-dimensional sheets. But we need kind of a three-dimensional design for what we would like. And then the last three are the different types of elect, uh, electroactive or electrochemical type of materials that you might be familiar with. The little demonstration I gave you on the zipper, um, you know, nitinol, uh, sometimes called muscle wire, if you will, nickel titanium, is a really good um, use probably for, for that type of advanced material. One thing when you're designing for astronauts or humans, it's really hard to scale some of these great materials up to human force torque level. We're actually pretty darn strong. Have like, so you might know about piezoelectrics or piezo ceramics. They make great little ants, make great little actuators maybe even a pump for a heart valve or something like that, but they don't scale up to the force and torque levels that we typically need that uh, humans, you know, we encounter all the time. So a lot of uh, some of the great advancements in materials too have not, they're not scaling up to what you would need for a human application. I have a few of them, a few other ones listed there. Okay, and then uh, some, some MIT colleagues, in particular uh, Paula Hammond and, and Greg Rutledge's lab, in terms of the electrospun materials, this is a pretty recent paper just out in Nature Materials. They actually are designing you know, three-dimensional electrospun materials. So that's fantastic, as I'm an aerospace engineer, not a material a scientist and engineer. Uh, but I can definitely say, here's the specificity of the material that I would like for the biosuit. Now can you guys make it for me? And again, they're making a lot of progress with some of these um, advanced technologies. So I'd just like to kind of highlight um, their work there. And then, um, then finally, kind of summing up, then we do have a fully digital design for our suit. It's been a wonderful international collaboration. We kind of scan you, um, custom design. We put all those, that mapping on you, if you will, calculate all these lines of non-extension, calculate all the skin strain, uh, stress analysis. And the mock-up that you're looking at right here has 340 meters. There's not a typo there. It has 340 meters of the red and the black lines that you see in that suit right there cover three football fields. So uh, pretty, pretty hard to believe. Okay, and um, we've been fortunate enough to get a, a lot of interest, mostly actually from museums. So as an engineer, who would have thought that you know, we'd be uh, having uh, exhibits and shows of, of the suit all over the world in, in different museums? So that's been a ca kind of a lot of fun. And the most important and fun thing for me is it puts engineering right out front. And it says, hey, you know, you want to do something cool, then you need to be an engineer and work on design and, and great <laughs> systems and things like that. So, um, you know, we've been fortunate to gain a lot of press and it's a great opportunity that we have to try to excite kids, especially to think about the engineering profession for, for their careers. And that they get to work on something really fun and exploratory. So the last um, part, of, part of my talk here, what I wanted to, to share with you are just, again, some other, some other designs that we're looking at and systems and, and some things I'll go over quickly that, um, again, just for performance, these are more for performance on Earth here, um, having the ability to look at human-powered flight. Um, the, the Daedalus was a human-powered aircraft that MIT worked on that set the world record for human-powered flight. The decavitator is, is a flying vehicle, if, if you will. I th oh, I think uh, that, that movie's not going to play. We look at other human performance. Again, it's all design, kind of the biomechanics. There's uh, my robot in the lab in, in action being controlled. Again, it's 12 degrees of freedom. So to me, again, it's just kind of a surrogate astronaut, if you will. There you can see 
um, uh, threw it off one of the students, controlling it. And again, it's giving us the, there's a little bit of a lag in the system there. It's giving us the, the joint torques, if you will, for, for these different motions. Oh, these little animations here. Um, these are not just cute. These robots have really been, been built, uh, Professor Mark Graber. Now watch the one on the left. Oh, you're supposed to clap. You guys didn't clap. You know how hard it is to get a biped to do a controlled flip? It's hard. Gymnasts can do it all the time. But when you build a robot to do that, you'll understand, and probably some of you have, just how difficult the control and dynamics are to make it stable. Quadrupeds, much easier. If you're going to do robotics, I start with a quadruped and then move up to a biped because uh, bipeds are pretty difficult. But again, these have all been built in terms of the real robots, and then the animations you see are really the physics-based simulation. That's really the real physics-based um, simulations that, that you see there. Okay, and then um, just moving along here, we'll see these uh, ostriches again. And we're just very inspired. I think nature has probably solved all of these problems. So again, we try to... Um, understand animals. Uh, this is a human animal here on the right. It's a colleague, actually a design colleague, Steve Copeland. And this is called the Greyhound Racer. And we're pretty sure it's the fastest aerodynamic vehicle uh, ever designed for a paraplegic athlete. So if you didn't have the use of your legs, we'd still like you to be able to do wonderful things like ride very fast. This is actually through the Philadelphia subway, just in case you've ever been there. It's good for our <laughs> video shoot. But you can see all the control it's coming from his upper body, his hands. He's going to use his hands because he has arm control. So here he's steering and control. He's going to use his hands to power the cycle. You can use one hand. You can use two hands here to get a lot of power, a lot of thrust. And you can also propel it by just one hand at a time using individuals. So there he goes. If you want a real power stroke, you can, always, you can also just use one hand at a time. So uh, we tested it in our wind tunnel to test the aerodynamics of it. You see he's supplying he's very, very close to the ground. You're kind of lying on the ground when you're, when you're riding this. And um, then we ran it around our track to test speed. And we had two uh, Olympic athletes on it, two paraplegic Olympic athletes, a, a female and a male, so that uh, we could test the aerodynamic measurements we take with their actual the athletic performance. But they wouldn't let the athletes ride it in the Boston Marathon. It was uh, deemed illegal because it's too fast, <laughs> too bad, because we wanted to break the records. But um, what they did, well, the reason they didn't uh, allow it, because for wheelchair design for races, like marathon races, you have to be sitting. It has to be more of a seated position, and this supine position obviously gives you an aerodynamic advantage. So it was uh, ruled that it wasn't legal for the Boston Marathon. But, so we'll see. Uh, but it's just a great project. Uh, all, all students were involved in all these projects, just with a little help from, from us as, as faculty. So it's really a tribute to, to the great students that we work with. And then again, another earth application here to um, thinking about helping people walk. Um, we had a project and we, were, we came up with an orthotic, an ankle orthotic design to help a person. This is the muscle modeling on the left, the animation. Which muscles are working? How do we have to control that? Here's a gentleman who suffers from drop foot pathology. Drop foot uh, occurs after stroke very often. So you can see, see this is our ankle, active ankle foot orthotic. His left leg, he's wearing the ankle foot orthotic. And what's happening is his right leg works fine. We know the ankle angles, the mobility we would like to get. We kind of beam those kinematics to the left leg. It's, we're using impedance control in this orthotic device. And we're having his left leg basically try to mimic the exact same motion as the right leg. In the design of the device, we put a torsional spring to, and uh, it dampens the drop foot. It, you would slap your foot down, so we put a torsional spring so that it doesn't hurt and you don't pop it. You wouldn't have the musculature to pick up your foot, to pick up your toes. So that's where we use, in this case, this is a, definitely a fusel, a linear series um, actuator to propel his foot up. So then, and then I said, then he can, it's a learning algorithm, so he could mimic then the left and the right foot. As you saw, though, he was tethered to the computers in the lab, so he couldn't walk home with the, the device on it. But, but my colleague Hugh Hare really specializes in um, active orthotic and prosthetic design, and his company now is, is commercializing um, this, this device. So other things we do, we're taking, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of data on the kinematics, how are people walking. 
This is actually a system we use now because uh, you might have one here on campus. You can do this with uh, camera systems, often motion analysis, very expensive systems, uh, maybe 200,000 know, US. So um, very expensive. Not everyone can afford one of those. So what we're doing kind of from the aerospace world is taking IMUs. You might be familiar with an inertial measurement unit that have accelerometers. You can get all six degrees of freedom. So basically, I can strap on these IMUs for right now a few thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars maximum. You have to do a lot of wonderful Coleman filtering and things like that in the signals. But essentially, we're trying to recreate the same type of data we would get from very high-end motion analysis systems. Why do we want to do that? Well, again, because I'd love to send parents home if they have a children with a child with a locomotion disease to have kind of a wearable lab, wearable sensors, if you will, that could be very affordable in the future for people. So. That's some of, this is some of our current um, you know, Earth uh, locomotion activity. We're looking at ground rea reaction forces. Here we're taking data from the IMUs as well as the video capture systems and showing that, um, that the systems are really performing equally well. The, the green and the, and the blue kinematic traces you see here for the knees and the ankles, that we can get the same uh, type of, of data from the IMUs and kinematics as, as those other much more expensive motion analysis systems. Okay, well you saw this, we're gonna go full circle here. Um, going back, to, so all of our work for astronauts and locomotion tries to inform as well as what might be some of the Earth applications that we can use here. So I think with that, I'm uh, ready to, to, to finish up uh, my comments. You guys have been very attentive, I appreciate it. These are just some images of where we're at now. We're actually doing a new helmet design for the, for the bio suit. Uh, we do um, also a lot of training and mission planning. This is the mission planning. If you really are a Martian astronaut, uh, I would like to give you a very, uh, the helmet looks the same, as this is an Apollo helmet up here, but now I'm gonna put a very uh, smart IT system and give you a lot of three-dimensional maps, topology, so you can put in your waypoints and you can plan your mission. We give you your physiological monitoring, what's my blood pressure, what's my heart rate, but also the navigation that you need to get your job done and, and looking at that kind of these days in, in three dimensions. Uh, a current suit for inside the vehicle is an exercise countermeasure suit that's kind of our latest suit that we've come up with and, and just um, patented and published. And this is a more of an exercise suit for inside the vehicle again. It's an extra, we call it the um, gravity loading suit, trying to counter this musculoskeletal loss that we've been talking about for the last hour. Some more of our designs for protecting cost, uh, astronauts. And then just to finish up, here's some we try to take everything we do in the lab and, and, and put it down to K through 12 for kids. So we develop software and this uh, physical device is called actually the Knowledge Station. And so it's currently at a museum now. We delivered it so that young kids can also see the enjoyment of space exploration. You can go to the International Space Station, you can go to Mars and learn about the biosuit or you can go to Europa in terms of some of the educational um, software for this Knowledge Station that we're trying to get kids excited about. Um, and then to finish with, uh, go full circle here, I, I gave you those, uh, that slide about what does it take to really do kind of engineering breakthrough technology and design. These great thinkers, what do they mostly have in common? Well, I think visionaries really um, somehow magically, almost intuitively comprehend the, the mysterious, They're looking very, very far ahead. And um, the common trait that I can come up with is, is really that they're taking all their life's experience and, and using that experience to, to you know, jump vast intellectual leaps and, and make bounds. And I would submit to you that it's in your imagination, uh, not imitation. Um, as engineers and engineering training, again, you get a lot of experience for imitating, trying to imitate nature, trying to, de trying to improve on our designs and do an iterative design. It's priceless, but you guys have some great ideas just in your, in your mind right now. So don't be afraid to have the wildest, craziest, even silliest idea you have, you know, that might be the next breakthrough engineering technology or device. So, so I'd encourage you to think about those great imaginative ideas and there's, there's no bad ideas. Uh, the only uh, wrong answer is not having an idea at all. So it's really in, in your imagination to think of uh, the next great things. And um, so you have the innovative ideas for, for engineering, I'm sure. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to, um, oh, I was actually, sorry, this is my last slide. I forgot that I put this slide in here. Um, another exploring Earth adventure that we did was uh, to sail around the, the world in our sailboat uh, a few years back and uh, learned a lot, saw very interesting cultures all around the world and taught uh, students from island nations uh, basically um, that they're the next future generation of astronauts 
because they know a lot about living in extreme environments. When you're on a sailboat or underwater the ocean or you're in a spacecraft, it's really all the same to me. You're kind of living in a very isolated, confined environment and you need to be provided with life support and, and things like that. So I'm sure that's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Newman, for the inspiring and engaging lecture. Now we move on to the question and answer session. Please come to the mic to address your questions, and do remember to introduce yourself, your name, and the organization you're from. Any questions? Can you please introduce yourself? Professor Newman, my name is Wu Sing Hong, uh, IES member. This imaginary question, this, when the astronaut dress up with these tight clothing, and here come to the philosophical uh, need, like exposing waste materials from body, solids, liquid, or gaseous. How is that handled? How, how do you cope with that? You understand my question? So repeat it again. I think I understand. Yeah, how do you deal with all the daily activities that... <laughs> I get that question a lot. When you all dress up like that, so, so You're kind of shrunk wrap in this suit, yes. So, um, a great question. And we don't have an elegant solution to that right now, and you probably know of the very uh, famous diaper incident. And, uh, but essentially, that's how, that's, how, uh, that's how you handle it right now, is essentially with a diaper type. It says you want to give astronauts water, a little bit of food to drink like that. You don't uh, take your suit off. Uh, you know, and, and do your business and come back. So you kind of go in the morning and, and go at, at night uh, with some precautions now. And that's what we actually use current technology we use in the current spacesuit as well. You use, we don't have any uh, advanced designs for that compared to current technology, which is essentially just kind of a diaper system that's currently used. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Bishin. I'm a mechanical engineering student at NUS. In all seriousness, how does one become an astronaut? Yeah. And how do you sign up to go to Mars? <laughs> how do you sign up? Well, the sign up list isn't quite open right now, but that's okay. How do you become an astronaut? Well, it's a great question. Uh, you might imagine all the students that work with me, I'm one of their aspiring astronauts. The wonderful thing is they're starting to become astronauts. I've been a faculty member for 20 years now, so it's great to... used to be a lot of friends and colleagues who joined uh, NASA to, to be an astronaut, but now the wonderful thing is my students are starting to make the astronaut corps. So uh, it, it's for everyone. It's uh, you know uh, there's astronauts. Uh, the NASA astronauts are are um, in the U.S., but uh, many other um, national in, nas international folks have flown with NASA. The Russians, of course, have cosmonauts, and, and now the Chinese have a few taikonauts. But when you talk to the taikonauts, they actually like to be called astronauts. So I call them Chinese astronauts. That's what they prefer. Um, engineering is a great uh, great start. Definitely say among the astronaut corps, uh, uh, there are the majority are engineers and then scientists. And it depends also if you count the military astronauts, because the military selects if uh, the pilots and the commanders of the missions are selected through uh, the military. So in the U.S., that's that's been through our Navy, uh, Air Force, and, and Army. But again, there's international folks. You don't um, have to be in the military, and that. Uh, line is very blurred now because uh, the automatic systems on, on these craft and spacecraft, you don't really need as much piloting experience as, as you once did. What you do need, though, is, in my opinion, you know, the engineering, the scientific base. Uh, there is also some medical doctors, some MDs. So really, engineering and, and science and MD is probably today the best, uh, the best preparation. A lot of passion, a little bit of luck. Did you put in your application? Uh, many astronauts have applied many, many times, many, up to 10 times. And, you know, usually you apply for a job and you get rejected, you, you know, you don't apply again. It's just the opposite with the astronaut corps. You know, you apply and uh, you get rejected. Okay, well, what can I do to kind of increase my chances? And you apply again and you apply again again. And some people uh, get it. It's not something I would uh, bet your career on because the probability is low because of the top applicants. There's thousands and thousands of applicants. But the very top applicants, the top 100 that get the full interview, they're think they're equally talented. So out of those top 100 folks, they might only pick 20 or 25 in a class, and that part of it is just almost random because those top, uh, that top, uh, you know, percentage is just very high quality, and they might just be putting together. Um, the other important things I think that NASA looks for in particular, since I know their selection process quite well, 
is how good are you at getting along with others? Um, what are your leadership qualities? What are your communication skills? Because they really are looking to distinguish. If you have the best technical skills in the world, that's great, but so does every other applicant that's making it to that level. But can you distinguish yourself in your communication ability, in your teamwork ability? Can you sometimes, in very extreme, terrible, crazy environments, sometimes you take the lead. Other times, can you sit back and, and be a follower? So it's really actually kind of some of these human skills that they might distinguish um, if you would actually get selected or not, because teamwork is so critical in terms of, just imagine our Mars mission again, four of us are gonna go, so we'll take these two, and our, we had two other volunteers. Now I lock you up into something smaller than your bathroom for the six month journey out and the year and a half here. So who wants to be locked up in a little teeny volume that you have to eat, sleep, and do everything in? So you know, people get on your nerves, right? So then the last uh, part to that question is not just getting along with people, but also understanding. So we call that you know, human factors, and the cycle social are the things that can really almost jeopardize the entire mission. And we've, we've had fist fights in space. <laughs> we've had people not getting along. Uh, thank goodness they haven't killed one another yet. But you know, we, we learn because we learn uh, right now just in terms of the space missions about putting people together. There's a lot to learn from undersea, uh, exploit submarines, undersea, Antarctic research, of course. If you go to Antarctica, if you go to the South Pole and you're locked up all winter, you, know, you don't get to get out. You have to live with these other people. So these are all things that we typically talk about. Good luck um, and dream big. If you talk to almost any person who's an astronaut, they had a dream and don't let anyone say no, it's not for you because it's for everyone in this audience if you choose it, you know, if you choose that. So uh, again, I wouldn't put all my, we call it, put all your eggs in that basket is one thing because it is a hard thing to attain, but absolutely uh, go for it and you might really surprise yourself and it's a wonderful career. Um, just to finish that a little bit. Now, this is uh, astronauts as we know them, but in your lifetime, in the next five years, this year, we'll be flying many more people into space. We, meaning the world, because the commercial space business now is in full operation. It's been a long time coming. Um, I hope there are not any accidents because an accident could really uh, derail the whole system. But these are right now kind of joy rides for, they're very expensive joy rides. <laughs> Um, and you go up for five minutes and it'd be fantastic to see that, the horizon and the curvature. You're not going into space. You're really just right now going up for a joyride if you go with Virgin Galactic or whoever. I would actually recommend going on the, the zero-G plane because you get a lot more parabolas for a lot cheaper price point right now. You get real microgravity. But um, that's, if, if it's successful, um, we're just, you know, uh, the students are really interested. Now it is students or former students who are running these uh, space companies, I'm really glad that the computer scientists, the very wealthy computer scientists love space because they're putting all their money into these commercial launch vehicles. I hope they're all successful. And so people will have the opportunity, again, lots of folks in this audience in your lifetime for sure, to do commercial space flights. So that's a whole, so many, many people will be astronauts or at least space travelers. And once we go to low Earth orbit, uh, then people are going to want to suit. They're going to want to go outside the spacecraft. I think that's going to happen quickly. It's, it's, it's going to happen really quick, I hope. And then probably next stop for tourism will be the moon. And uh, we have this technology and convention, and I hope so, because when we rely on the world um, governments, even though it's great and very necessary for the investment, but um, you know the bureaucracy is, is much slower and takes time. So I see a really nice mix of uh, you know, astronauts of the future will be both kinds. They'll be kind of from, from world governments funded, but they'll also be the commercial type of space travelers. Hello, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Newman. Uh, my name is Liu Hang from NUS Mechanical Engineering. I have a question. Um, in spacesuit design, you always have this contrary requirements of flexibility and protection. So uh, my question is, since you have addressed the flexibility issue on this requirement, what is the protection reference that you are taking for your biosuit design? And to the follow-up to this question, uh, there are a lot of research done into power exoskeletons, which is a way to address the, the needs for humans to power heavy systems. So if, let's say, powered exoskeletons succeed in developing such technology, that means in the future, humans going to space, they can actually wear a really heavy spacesuit that's capable of protecting them uh, for all kinds of requirements, and at the same time being able to do uh, certain jobs 
that's as flexible as humans because of this power exoskeleton. So how do you see, I mean, to me, this is like a fight between uh, a lightweight system as to a full-fledged, complete uh, production system. So uh, how do you see uh, this development is going on in the future uh, for this kind of fight? Right, so as you point out, so we've been, uh, so our policy really concentrated on the mobility and the flexibility, very, very lightweight, order of magnitude reduction in uh, mass, if you will, um, greatly enhanced mobility. In terms of the protection, um, no spacesuit right now offers you uh, ra enough radiation protection probably for, for the Mars mission, so that's something. But we probably won't design it on the suit because you pay a huge mass penalty. You probably go into more radiation shelters for the moon and Mars. That makes a lot of sense. Temporary radiation shelters, especially for uh, solar um, type of flares and things like that, if they can be protected. Now you're, so again, we're looking at pressure production. You want to look at micrometeorite um, hits. This is actually just kind of a pressure layer. We actually envision you would put on other layers, light layers, but this is how we do exploration right now in Antarctica and other places. Even if you uh, go snow skiing, you know, you put on thermal clothing. So the thermal conditioning for micrometeorite protection, we think that you can do that, still be very mobile, but then you add some other capability that, that we're not addressing right now, but we think about it, of course, Jumping to your exoskeleton, powered exoskeletons, you know, we've been working on this for 50 years. And um, a bit of a shame, a bit of an insult, I guess, to our engineering profession that it's taking 50 years. Uh, there have been some breakthroughs recently. This, this year, last year, is very uh, nice in terms of some powered exoskeleton designs. But um, we've been working on exoskeletons, powered exoskeletons, longer than we've been working on space as we. I mean, again, the community of, of engineers, they're too massive, they're too heavy. I actually don't see them at, at useful at all for space travel, given the mass penalty. Um, where I do see them useful is in glove design. For space, the space applications, it would be really nice to have an actuated, uh, maybe glove design, um, little actuations here. I don't see them in terms of helping the mobility on the suit, because people are so good anyhow. I want to use the natural mobility. But uh, for biomedical devices, they make a lot of sense. I think the exoskeleton work right now would be much more beneficial to help people walk here on Earth. Uh, we get a great benefit when we're in microgravity or even the moon or Mars because it's so light. So I don't think we'll need too much exoskeleton actuation, like I said, except for the glove design is very challenging. So maybe actuating some hands and glove motion. But the promise, again, for 1G and helping with movement here on Earth um, for different pathologies, uh, you know, I hope the exoskeleton works keeps going on. We, I actually think of the biosuit and some of our design as a soft exoskeleton. So what I'm going to spend my oh, time looking yeah. at in the future is more of a soft exoskeleton because, again, it's been pretty limited progress into the bulky, mechanical, electrical systems that we typically think of as exoskeletons. Okay. Thanks for Thank the you. question. Yeah. Sure. We have time for one last question. Okay. I'm Victor Shim from uh, NUS Engineering. I have a question about the adaptability of uh, the suit. Um, you talk about a time frame of four years, and I think for most of us, in, in, a, in a period of four years, we either put on weight or we lose weight. Um, perhaps astronauts are different, but um, what happens if an astronaut puts on weight or loses weight over the, the four years? Does the suit work just as well? Can it adapt to these changes? or? Is there some other way to, yeah, to sort of manage that? Yeah, a good that. question. We've thought about it, and um, I'm only going to give you a couple kilos, okay? So <laughs> you're going to have to keep your weight within a few kilos, right? Maybe you lose a pound. Now, um, what happens to astronauts uh, right away when they go into space, the weightless environment of space, you, you might lose weight. Really what you do is you lose plasma. You lose fluid. We have a massive fluid shift when astronauts go into space in this weightless environment you're going to lose uh, a few liters of fluid, of, of plasma, basically. So morphology, you know, your body changes a little bit in space. Um, grow a little taller, that's great for me, you know, because I always wanted to be taller. Um, your spinal col you know, without, without the loading of gravity, your spinal column might be extended. As a matter of fact, uh, people grow about two to four centimeters. Um, the downside is it causes a lot of back pain in some of the astronauts. <laughs> Um, unfortunately. Some people get it, some don't. You know, we just don't know. And then we call it chicken legs. You go into space, you get this massive fluid shift, right? You get puffy faces, kind of feels like you have a cold sinus, and you get fat cheeks and kind of puffy faces because of this fluid shift more around the thorax to your heart, the fluid. And what happens is, we call it chicken legs because now your legs look a little bit thinner. 
with this massive uh, fluid shift. Um, it's fine, you can, you, know, you can live, but again, you don't have the gravity pulling down all this, this fluid, it's usually excreted. But again, it's not major weight loss, it's just kind of change in the fluid system. Uh, but again, uh, we, we need to be eating nutritious and, and not having people gain a lot. Your question was, okay, how, how can we accommodate that if we have this tight-fitting pressure suit? So um, again, we've tested it. Again, it goes to the elasticity, and we would need some smart sensors and measure that. Because my design problem is, am I still applying 27, 30 kilopascals to you? So if I have a little sensor, and again, that's really where some good active technology comes in. So I can probably give you Oh, you know, I'm only going to give you about a centimeter or so, again, to, to accommodate something. I'm not going to be able to change grossly because even though I'll be pro providing too much pressure if you go too big, <laughs> if you get a little bit smaller, again, we'd like to be able to crank up the suit a little bit. And we've been surprised in our results that um, we thought it has to be a constant pressure suit. I need constant pressure over your whole body because physiologically we don't do well with a very high pressure here and a lower pressure here. We, our blood flow and physiology, we don't handle that well. So it has to be constant pressure, but then again, can I regulate essentially the, the pressure a, a bit? But we think we can probably control it within plus or minus five kilopascals using some, some advanced uh, materials. But that's, that's it, I can't, you know, the suit needs to provide about, another way to say that is 25 kilopascals. Maybe I can regulate it plus or minus five kilopascals um, with some different designs of materials to get 30 kilopascals. And so that would, uh, help you change for some change in weight or morphology, slightly. Thank you, Prof. Newman. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for your interesting questions. All too soon, we have to wrap up this session. For your information, the BioSuit will be on display at the Engineering Corner at the National Library Board, or NLB, from 26 oh, March onward to 15 April. So, if you are keen to view the BioSuit, please head down to the National Library Board. With that, let us thank Prof. Newman again for the engineering lecture. With a biosuit that's sleek, engineering is definitely making a new fashion statement. And on that note, we have now come to the end of our lecture. We hope that you have had an inspiring evening. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, on another note, can we please invite uh, Dean of Engineering, Professor Chaning Soon, Deputy Dean of Engineering, Professor Lim Seichuan, Seichun, Professor Victor Shim from the External Relations Office, Professor Go Wan Ling from NTU, and Mr. Neil Kok Bing from IES to come down for a group photo. Yeah, right down here. Thanks. <laughs>